Luke chapter 7, verse 11, and it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. And our subject is our losses without God, without Christ. And we read this passage in our scripture reading where the Lord Jesus Christ traveled, walked from Capernaum to a large village really, not so much a town, called Nain. It was something like 25 miles southwest of Capernaum. In those days, it would have taken between nine and 11 hours, that journey. Why did he go there? And yet for all the distance that he took, there was a great crowd of people with him. Disciples, not just the 12, but many others also, disciples as it were with a small d, and many other curious people, a great crowd. Probably they would have outnumbered the occupants of the village, of the very, very small town at most. And when they arrived, I'm sure you're familiar with the narrative to some extent, when they arrived at Nain, there was a funeral procession coming out of that place. And we read, the, now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city, described as a city, well, the original doesn't necessarily need to be translated that way. It really, really is a very small place to this day. And much people of the city was with her. There was so much sympathy. It turns out from the narrative that the man is a young man. So it's a very tragic situation. He has died. What, from what? We don't know. But he's died. And uh, his mother is a widow. And of course, at that time, he would have been her only means of support. He would have looked after her, uh, presumably, uh, in the order of things. He would have married and had children, and his family would have been his mother's delight. And that was the situation. And she's lost him. And so there's great sadness. And when the Lord saw her, the narrative tells us, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. But the Lord did not have compassion on every widow who lost an only son. The Lord did not go about Galilee and Judea and elsewhere, raising up the dead. In fact, he did, did, chose to raise only three people from the dead, all comparatively young people. But it wasn't his custom. He would show his great compassion by these demonstrations of raising those three from the dead, apart from the many thousands of healings that he performed. But that was not his prime purpose in doing this healing, to select one person for such a uh, raising of the dead. It was because every miracle he performs has really three functions. Every miracle Christ performed, particularly the great healing miracles, the vast majority of them were that. Every miracle he was performed authenticated him. That was one purpose, to demonstrate that he was divine, that he was the incarnate son of God. So he did the most difficult, seemingly impossible things. The second purpose of the miracle was to show his heart, his kindness, his compassion, to show the very heart of God, the love of God, because that's what he'd come to do, make a way of salvation and forgiveness for needy sinners. And the miracles demonstrated his mercy and his kindness. And the third purpose of the miracles was to demonstrate how he heals souls. So sick bodies, or even a dead body, the fact that he had the power of life or the power to heal, also showed how he would go about healing people spiritually, healing our spiritual death, healing our spiritual 
in infirmities, illnesses, our separation from God, our sinfulness. So there was always a threefold purpose, and that's very clear from the Gospels. And so we come this evening not so much to look at the literal event. Oh, he healed, or rather gave life to a young man who had died, but to see the, what this illustrates, what it shows about him, what it shows about life and about death. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city were with her. And when he raised this young man, well, the report of it went everywhere in the region that Nain was in. And uh, people heard about these things. But this is a picture for us tonight of spiritual death. Are we spiritually dead or alive? That's the great question to ask. The young man was motionless. That's obvious. Life had departed. No processes of life were in action within that body. It was lifeless. There was no communication. He was incapable of happiness or experience of any kind. Felt no pain, nothing. He was dead. I'm only saying the obvious. And that is a picture of spiritual death. It answers to the same things. If we are spiritually dead, viewed spiritually, there's no life activity in the soul. None at all. There's no communication with God. There's nothing like that. There's no understanding of God. There's no interest in God. There's no real desire for God. There's no concern about whether we're spiritually dead or alive. You can look at the body and you can say, surely he's not long been dead. There will be some evidence of activity and life. No, there's nothing. Life has gone. It's over. There's no hope. And so it is with spiritual death. You can be physically alive and spiritually inert, dead, motionless, inactive. In other words, you've lost the most vital dimension or the activity of it anyway, your soul. You can move your hands and feet, you can think, you can do all manner of things, but your soul can't do anything. The most important, the enduring part of you is motionless and lifeless, inactive. And the tragedy is that for many people, spiritual death is irreversible. If you could see to the end of their lives, you would say, they never repented. They never sought God. They were never moved to seek him. They never worried about him. They never thought about him. They stayed that way, lifeless, not a flicker of anything, right to the day that physical life also was extinguished. No light in the eye of the corpse. No understanding of the per in the person who's spiritually dead. No understanding that this is a created universe and that we are created by the hand of God. No understanding of eternity, that the soul is forever. No understanding of life after death. No understanding of God's character and what he requires of us. No understanding of our own state and condition, really. No understanding of how God saves people and brings them to know him and gives them life. No understanding of his ways, of his words of the Bible, not a flicker. The light has gone completely out of the eye, spiritually. There's no conversation. No conversation with God. No prayers are offered. No interaction with him. No answers to prayer are ever experienced 
and wondered at. If you're spiritually alive, if you walk with God, if you know him, oh, you have so many experiences and answers to prayer, large and small, and often amazing and astonishing. And you're certain of these things, and you know these things, but not if you're spiritually dead. If you're spiritually dead, there's no spiritual pulse. There's no life. There's no hope. There's nothing in you. There's no influence. You can't pray for situations or for other people. There's no friendship with God. You can't speak to him and know his love and know his dealings with you. No friendship with him. No deep pleasure no prospect of eternity or heaven, no real happiness, no development of character. You're a spiritual corpse. I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, but you can't get over your sins. You can correct some things a little bit for a while, but you can't really improve yourself. And the things that at times you regret about yourself, you can't mend them, you can't get past them, you won't deepen or grow in character and niceness and uh, virtues, not at all, because you haven't any operation of God within you. You won't appreciate him, you don't want to worship him, or to be spiritually dead is a terrible thing for us, and that's how we set out in life, spiritually dead, all for ourselves. I'm talking about spiritual death, but I don't want to give the impression it's something you can't help, like an illness that you just catch and you can't help. The terrible thing about spiritual death is that we aid and abet it constantly. We want to be spiritually dead. Somebody tells us about God and about salvation and about forgiveness, about Christ, about heaven. We don't want to know. We don't want to hear it. We're dead, but there's a kind of, I know this sounds a contradiction in terms, but there's a kind of willfulness about it. That's how we want to be. That's how we want to stay. We're determined. We're resistant to any persuasion to change us. We're very proud of being spiritually dead and nobody and nothing seems to be able to move us. Isn't it an extraordinary thing? Spiritual death, that's what it's about. So there it is. There is the body being carried out of the village in an open coffin and it's cold. I'm sorry to put it this way, but the young man's been dead some time. It's cold and so are we spiritually. There's no conscience in us. We're not worried about what we do and what we are. There's no conviction. There's no concern. We're spiritually cold. There's no sense of sin. There's no longing to be clean, to be accepted by God, to have a better state and condition. So there's no experience of God. And you know also... It all means that we are of no value to God. Spiritually dead, we, are of no, we have no worth to him. No value at all. Everybody wants to feel of value to somebody, to loved ones, to family. You might want to be feeling of value in the world or to other people. Oh, you... You may say, oh, I don't want to be famous, but I do like to feel I have some worth, that I am of value. But the terrible thing is to God, if we're spiritually dead, we are of no value. We have nothing we can offer him, nothing we can bring him. We, can be, we cannot be useful to him. We cannot be used by him. Not until he forgives us and gives us life and changes us. It's been said, we are dead while we live. Physically alive, spiritually dead. We don't learn anything about him. We don't want to. We don't reproduce in the spiritual realm. We're not walking with God ourselves. How can we talk to somebody else about the Lord, 
and bring them to seek him and find him and know him. We cannot reproduce. We don't have God, Christ, as a redeemer, as our Lord and our guide, as our physician who mends our character and helps us. We don't have him as a shepherd. We don't have him as a friend. These are the things we lack. It's morbid. It's dismal. But we have to face it. Spiritual death is a terrible thing. And there's no eternal life for us, only eternal death and punishment as rebels against God. No hope of heaven or life. We are spiritually dead without conversion. Now, this young man was carried on a bier, old-fashioned English word for a kind of open platform or coffin for burials. And many people were very sympathetic to his mother. But he was carried out, it's there in verse 12. Behold, there was a dead man carried out. What a striking picture that is. That's what's happening to us. If we're spiritually dead, we may be physically alive, but viewed spiritually, we are in the process of being carried out. By the mercy of God, he continues to sustain us, sustain us in breath, in life, but really we're of no use to him, we have no value to him, we're spiritually dead, we're in the process of being slowly carried out. That's the truth about us. We're pictured by this. Now this young man, I assume he'd been fit and strong. I assume he'd been able to till the field of the uh, kind of homestead, of the uh, uh, small patch of land or farm that everybody had in the villages in those days, the small holding, if you like. He'd felled trees, he'd plowed, he'd done everything necessary, he'd done hard physical work, tended the fruit trees, drawn water from the well, and all these things. He was strong and capable and able, but now he doesn't move a muscle. He's dead, he has to be transported, carried, even from the village to the graveyard. And that's a picture of us when we're spiritually dead. As I mentioned, by the mercy of God, by the toleration of God, by the long suffering of God, he supports us and sustains us on the way to eternal death. We have no interest in him, no love for him, no prayer to him. It's all by God's long suffering. Our journey through life is a journey out. What a way to look at it. And yet that's true of spiritual death. It's like somebody in a boat lost the oars, perhaps, caught up by the current of a rapid flowing river being carried to a walk the waterfall, strewn with rocks and certain death. And we're just being carried to the last day, helplessly. Oh, you don't see yourself like that. Oh no, I've got an active mind. I've got a good job or training or profession. I'm full of ideas. I've got a sense of humor, I make people laugh. I enjoy life and all the things I can have and all the things I can do. But viewed spiritually, you're just being carried, floating to the day of disaster. I know not a sign of spiritual life in you, going to your eternal fate. I have to put it like this, dear friends. I have to try for our sakes to wake us up to these realities, to these things. But let's switch tone entirely because also pictured here is the way in which Christ gives life. Spiritual life is given. Now, first of all, it's worth noting that Christ was never asked to leave Capernaum and go to Nain. Nobody sent for him. Nobody asked him even when he drew near to the village called the city in our translation, nobody sent for him, asked him if he could do anything. I suppose they didn't know who he was. 
they might have guessed news of this Christ and his miracles would have reached even Nain. And here this man arrives right outside the place with such a retinue, with disciples and a great crowd of curious people. They might have known he was somebody eminent, somebody special at the time. But nobody asks him anything. Of course, this was his first occasion of raising someone from the dead. Then it would be the daughter of Jairus, and towards the very end of his earthly life and ministry it would be the raising of Lazarus. So even those who may have known or guessed who he was wouldn't have thought he could raise a dead man. So he wasn't asked. And it's worth noting this because it's like this with us. When we come to the Lord, when we come to see our need and to seek salvation and forgiveness and spiritual life, it's usually God who takes the initiative. He sends someone to us. He wakes us up. He takes the initiative. We never seek after him, not as a rule. He extends his arm to us. But here it is, how he gives life with his great compassion. He came, of course, from heaven to earth. He came from heaven to Calvary's cross to suffer and to die for those who would be saved, redeemed. He took upon himself on Calvary's cross all the punishment that we should have borne eternally in order to purchase the right to forgive us and to save us. And now he's come to earth and he's going to give life to this young man. But it's a picture of how he comes to us as individuals. The young man couldn't ask. He was dead. He had no strength. He had nothing to offer. He had no voice. He couldn't see. So it is with us. You don't, we don't ask after Christ. We don't pray to him out of the blue, Lord, save me. Perhaps you've come into this service this evening and you've never heard anything like this before. It may be the Lord taking the initiative, beginning to awaken your soul and open your eyes and call you to himself. And that's what this is a picture of here. Christ comes all the way from Capernaum Though he can heal thousands and he can speak to vast crowds, he's come to this village for the sake of demonstrating his power to one young man. And this is how he does it. Verse 14, he came and touched the coffin and they that bear him stood still. They realized something was going to happen. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, Arise. That's extraordinary. He spoke to the corpse. He spoke to the dead man. Who would do such a thing? Well, Christ can speak to the dead. And he can speak to our dead souls. He can speak to us when we're spiritually dead. And quite unable to speak to him. And he can summon our attention and enlighten our mind and wake us up and say, come to me. Come and seek my forgiving love. Come and seek life. And he can speak by his spirit in such a way that we feel that drawing and that strong need and that desire to repent and to find him. In fact, we can hear him so clearly in a sense that we can become quite desperate. I must be forgiven. I must find Christ. And our friends don't know what's happened to us. They say, my friend, he's never been interested in this before. He's a very free-living individual. And here he is, concerned about his sin, feeling a strong need of forgiveness, feeling he must find God. That's the voice of Christ, the work of the Spirit within the heart. Young man, I say unto thee, may I put the emphasis on the I? I say unto thee, it's all the authority of Christ. Arise, and Christ may speak to hearts here tonight. Get up, arise. Conversion to Christ 
is an ascent. It's a getting up, it's a being lifted up higher from all that deadness and selfishness and pride and sin to find him and to know life and to love him and serve him and live for him. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up. The people were astonished. People are astonished with us too. There are many people in this congregation even tonight. And their homes, their parents, whether they were Christians or not, their work colleagues, they knew them, knew them well. And all their faults and failings and tempers and reactions. And they knew them as people who could enjoy themselves and people also who could sin grievously. And people who were not interested in God and were proud of themselves and self-confident and self-sufficient. And now they see different men, different women. They see people who are much gentler, much kinder, much stronger, much more able to resist sin, much more outgoing, altogether different men and women of prayer, men and women who walk with God, men and women who are nothing like us ruffled by earthly troubles because they have a hold on eternal life and divine resources, different people. And it's obvious the dead have sat up and come to life and now have spiritual life and spiritual hope. They that bear him stood still, and verse 15, he that was dead sat up. Oh, these words are tremendous. Christ said, I say unto thee, the personal call of Christ to your soul may come when you hear preaching, may come when you're reading the Bible, the Gospels perhaps, for yourself. It may come when a Christian friend is reasoning with you. You need Christ saying. You need to pray to him. You need to repent of sin and find him. And the call of Christ comes in right in to your dead soul, to your heart. Come to me. Come to me for life and forgiveness, for strength and for eternal life. And he that was dead sat up he responded to the call of Christ and to the command of Christ and began to speak. Of course, our foolish minds, we want to know what he said. Why does Dr. Luke, the physician who wrote the Gospel of Luke, why doesn't he tell us what the young man said? Well, that would be fatal. If he told us what the young man said, we would stop thinking about Christ and his power and the amazing thing that he was doing and we'd start looking at this entirely at a petty human level as though it was a soap opera. What did he say? So he doesn't tell us what he said. So let me have a shot at telling you what he said. And it's pure speculation. Surely he prays God. Surely he gave thanks. Surely he said he was not worthy. Surely he, as it were, embraced Christ and poured out his heart in dedication to him and gave him his life. That's what I believe anyway. He that was dead sat up and began to speak and he delivered him to his mother. There was a great change. He was now alive and he'd been dead. He was functioning, only a touch and a word from Christ and he was changed entirely. He had spiritual consciousness now. He had spiritual understanding now. He was filled with wonder. And so are we when we come to Christ. And we're given new, a new nature, a new heart, interaction with him. We are instantly alive. This was instant. He that was dead sat up 
and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. He probably towered over his mother, but he delivered him to his mother. Dear friends, the impact on the, here, the people that viewed this. Verse 16, there came a fear on all, a great awe, we might say. And they glorified God. They all praised God. A great prophet is risen up among us. God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him, that's our translation, is a little old-fashioned. The Greek says this word of him. In other words, this report of him. His reputation went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region, round about. And whether that place in those days of Nain, little more than a large village, was a kind of a market town in, on a small scale, whether it was set on the, what was in those days a trade route through, but people seemed to carry this report far and wide. And so it is, if you're converted to God, if your sins are forgiven because you repent of your sin and ask for life, if your life is changed, the people about you will notice it and know it. They may not want to say much, it may challenge them too much, but they'll take note of it and it'll spread around the office in no time and the family, where you stand, what you live for. They, they could see the difference. Wasn't it obvious? Is this the young man who was dead? He's alive? That's spectacular. And it's rather spectacular with us when we're converted. The difference it makes to us and the change that takes place. So you're observed and it's noticed. And we've been considering, for instance, the... Uh, Accounts of conversion from years and years ago that took place when C.H. Spurgeon was the preacher in this place. And the testimonies, the reports of the people who were converted and what was said about them. Oh, this man used to be a drunkard and he drinks no more. That young woman used to be an absolute hooked theater goer I suppose you'd say moviegoer today and now finds no pleasure in those things. This person was forever in the dance hall, in the ballroom, and has left that and sees the sinfulness and the smallness of it all. The reports, we know when people are converted, somebody is absolutely dumbstruck by celebrities and and stars of uh, performance and, and bands and so on. And then they see through it all and they stop talking about all that. They're no longer slaves to all that. They've got deeper and higher things to think about and to talk about. And you see the changes all the time. If somebody is stuck in the old groove, you question whether they're really converted. Because when you come to Christ and you get spiritual life, everything changes. And you're his, and you've discovered a whole new life. And that's observed by all around you. Well, I must come to conclusion. I'm over time. I'd like to just go back as we close then to... Uh, the compassion of the Lord in verse 13. When the Lord saw the widow, he had compassion on her. I just pick out that word, compassion. Does it cross your mind that if you became concerned for your soul and you prayed for life and conversion and forgiveness, does it cross your mind Oh, what if God will not hear me? What if I've been too bad? What if I've been too hardened, too far away? What if he will not hear me? Well, here's a warrant of faith for you. The compassion of the Lord. The compassion of the Lord. He never turns a seeking heart away. In fact, a person only seeks because Christ has called him in the first place. 
If you hear the voice of God, not literally, but in your heart, as it were, come to me. Lay aside all your selfish ambitions. Come to me. Repent of your sin. Seek me and find me. Respond to it. That's your authority, your warrant, your certainty. All the promises of God are behind it. The compassion of the Lord. He will never turn away an earnest seeker or responder to his call. Well, that's my message for this evening. Why did Christ go all the way to Nain from Capernaum? Yes, to demonstrate his divinity. Yes, to demonstrate his heart of compassion, to manifest his great power, but to give us an illustration of spiritual death and spiritual life. Let's pray together. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, look upon us, speak to our hearts. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wilt stretch forth thine arm and bless us and change us, draw us to thyself. Come, Lord, in soul-saving power and deal with men, women, young people, even in this place tonight. We ask it in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.